came already in October. Uh, this was like the spot, the free spotlight for, for her to do a seminar. So she is from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, she gradu graduated, she did the, her bachelor and PhD in ecology, mm -hmm. biology and ecology in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma of Mexico. Uh, then, but after graduating, she moved to the National Commission of Biodiversity, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And yes, right after that, uh, she started working as a researcher associate in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma, where she is now BI. <coughs> and so that's the introductions for uh, the major your talk. Thanks. Thank you very much for that here. Um, before going right into the, the talk, I would like to say a little bit, very, very brief, my uh, uh, background, although it was already all, all said. Um, I was born, raised, and have lived ever since in Mexico City. So I really needed to study something that allowed me to get out of there as often as possible and as close to nature as I could. So I did that. I studied, I studied biology at the National University of Mexico, which is the, the biggest university, public university in, in the country. I did uh, biology and I graduated doing uh, shrimp uh, physiology work. Then I, um, I went to my PhD. I didn't do any masters. Uh, we were allowed to do that. Uh, it was, at the time, it was called the Centro de Ecología. It wasn't an institute, a research institute yet. And there I did some genetics, physiology with a uh, rodent species. And before I finished uh, my, my PhD, I, I had the great opportunity to go to do a scientific visit in UCLA, in Rob Wayne's, Rob Wayne's laboratory. That's where I met Jennifer Alcárez, uh, and there I was introduced to the wonders of microsatellite work and the horrors of working with radioactivity, which lucky for me was the first and last time doing any radioactivity. I, I, I graduated and, and started working in the Commission, National Commission of Biodiversity, it's an intergovernmental CD uh, organization in Mexico, very there was a seminar in December with a uh, researcher that came from there. And I, did, I stayed there a little bit, let study two years, and was able to go to the University of Queensland in Australia to do a postdoc with uh, Dr. Carl, uh, Dr. Craig Moritz in private geography. And I did that because I wanted to go to Australia to uh, uh, Dr. Moritz, but also because I knew paleogeography was a new, very new, back then, uh, research field that allowed me to be hired in what is now the Instituto de Ecología. Uh, I came back from the, the, the postdoc and got um, my, my job uh, right away. The Institute of Ecology is in, in southern Mexico City, but we are really, really lucky that it is established, the whole campus is on a lava flow remains of a volcano that erupted <coughs> 400 years before, something like that. And that's the kind of vegetation we have. Mm -hmm. And my institute is <coughs> beside the, the botanical garden, so mm -hmm. we can go mm -hmm. and walk there. And it's, it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. the scenery, despite being in, in the city. Okay, and there I have um, the laboratory where I work, and there's all, all other three researchers in the same laboratory. It's called Genetica <coughs> and And I always have trouble doing one thing or concentrating in only one thing. And you see that that's how or why, I guess, I go through all the different subjects, uh, research lines population, landscape, genetics, phylogeography, etc. All of them, uh, the, the, the common themes are genetics and vertebrates. I, I work with animals, oh, also some invertebrates. We've done uh, studies with the parasites. And all of those are pictures of species that we have. 
work with. Uh, and there are just a few of the many that we studied. And very, very recently, we're starting like three years ago, we started to work a little bit in urban ecology and uh, urban evolution, microbiome, and relating it to ecology and landscape genetics and trying to get into landscape adaptation and selection. So that's where we are now in the lab. Uh, <clears throat> to get into my talk, um, I want to tell you two stories, uh, one regarding turtles and one regarding crocodiles, as, as uh, the title said. And it has to do in, in a very, very general means, a very general way of trying to understand, study, evaluate how species colonize, distribute in, in, in how, what limits and facilitates the distribution of, of natural species and how in particular they colonize novel environments. And I said novel environments because one of the themes, biological invasions, have to do with that, to how species are able to colonize um, habitats that are not necessarily their, not their natural ones or native ones. We, we've tried with these two, two lines of research, we've tried to elucidate patterns and processes of how species are distributed, what forces uh, allow them, evolutionary, biographical, and ecological forces allow them or limit them to, to distribute and to uh, colonize. And we have uh, also a specific theme in monitoring biotic interchange, especially with the exotics and invasive species. Uh, and all of them, again, trying to have some, in, some application and some results regarding conservation of biodiversity. These two stories, these two projects are the, they started as the job, that's the uh, work of two excellent PhD students that we, we, I had in, in my lab. Saira Spindola working with turtles and Walberto Pacheco uh, working with the crocodiles. And uh, so mo much of what I'm going to show you is part of their thesis, <laughs> but it's, it's been two projects that have been going on for, for many, many years now. Uh, so many more people have gone into, into these uh, projects and contributed and starting to work. So main themes are their, their thesis, but um, we have more, more job in that. So getting into natives, exotics, and terms of biological invasions. The turtle project, it's, uh, I, I can summarize it in these two um, publications, and I show them to you if you are interested in, in going into more detail that I won't be able to, to do here for limit time. You can always go and check them. So, <clears throat> slider turtles, uh, for those that are herpetologists might know them, they are very, very diverse um, taxa in, in, in the Americas about 17 species and 19 subspecies. Last time I checked, uh, it's, it's dynamic taxonomy. And the red slider turtle, or also called the Japanese turtle, it's uh, Trachemis scripta elegans, is one of these uh, species. And it became worldwide famous because starting in the 50s and going all the way into the 70s, early 80s, it became the favorite pet uh, animal in, in ev for every child in the world. And uh, they, they are, you're, you're going to see they are native in the Americas, but um, this, this species actually was um, brought to Japan and they pr actually produced them there. And then from Japan, they distributed to all the pet stores in the world. That's why it's called Japanese total. Um, and by 2000, it was classified as one of the worst invasive species in the world. And by uh, 2019, it was the last uh, evaluation, it was already present in 70 countries as an exotic invasive species around the world. And well, why were we so keen on studying uh, the red slider? It's because Mexico has a great native diversity of this 
genus of trachemis, you can see um, all of the great um, are parts where we have the species. And in particular, uh, elegance, the, the red ear, uh, ear slider, its native distribution is, as I said, the west coast of um, the east coast of US. And it goes a little bit into Mexico in the very northern border, uh, the northern of the Tamaulipas state. That's its native um, range. And then we have in, in a very neat geographical gradient going all the way south along the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, we have another uh, trachemis, trachemis cataspila, which is endemic. As you can see, it's, it's restricted in this area of distribution. Then it follows trachemis venusta, another species that goes all the way until the Yucatan Peninsula and a little bit into um, Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and Belize. And we also have, um, at least in, in, our, in our radar, this micro micro endemic, trachemis tylori, which lives in wetlands in a very desertic zone in the, in the north of Mexico, which is desert wetlands and zillions of endemics, and one of them is trachemis tylori. So we, having this scenario, we wanted to explore different things. First, uh, how are the genetic and evolutionary patterns among these four trachemis, which have this gradient? And we also, but, and most importantly, we wanted to learn how was the invasion scen scenario, scenario in, along this co-distribution with, with the congeners. And I said we were very intrigued because trachemis escrita had been very, very well studied everywhere else in the world but Mexico. We didn't know anything about how invasive it was, how it was distributed, or if it wasn't invasive. And um, trachemis are also known because they are, uh, they are easily hybridizing among them. And uh, we also wanted to see what would happen in, in terms of hybridization in this uh, gradient. Okay. And um, you will see along the talk this color code uh, elegance in, in red dots, Venusta in orange, Catespilla in purple, and Taylor in blue, following this uh, geographic gradient. We did a lot of field work. It was really, really fun doing all this sampling along the, the, the coast. They are freshwater turtles, not marine. Um, for the native uh, range, we had samples from mainly two, three museums, uh, those three museums from US. We didn't do any field work in the US, we couldn't do that, but we had plenty of samples from, from museum, and all of those, uh, the rest of the samples are from our own field work. So we were able to get four, 49 localities, over 260 individuals. We have, along the way, we've been working with <coughs> mitro, uh, sequences, mitochondrial and, and nuclear sequences, microsatellite loci, and also um, genomic data with SNPs, yeah. uh, uh, a little bit over 63,000. Uh, okay. um, and I'm going to be showing you what we have found. I'm not going into any metho methodological details. If you have any questions, please uh, ask me or uh, you can check them in the papers. What I will, what you will see always is what um, analysis we did, what uh, gene uh, we used, and what was the, the software or the program. Uh, so you will have that information there. So our first, our first uh, question was a little bit more taxonomical uh, to confirm if these species, the four in the gradient, were taxonomically different. And yeah, we're, they are clearly divergent as in accordance with the taxonomy already known and with the geographic distribution they have. And I would like to just show here that script the elegance, the, it is one of the, um, is, is the uh, separate clade uh, from the other three and it's the oldest in the, in the divergence. The, the Catespila, Venusta, Tyloria are, are a bit, a bit younger. So they, they are different. In terms of hybridization, 
Interestingly, we didn't find any significant signals of hybridization between these, these four. We, we got signs of ancient integration, especially between Elegans and Catasphila, which, as you remember, are the two bordering ones. And just a weak signal of more, much, much more recent um, integration uh, between Catasphila and Venusta, again, the two following in the, in the gradient, but not, uh, not any significant hybridization. You can see the four genetic clusters very, very clearly differentiated. And these are two individuals that are uh, cat elegans Catasphila, uh, pardon, I mean Catasphila venusta, but no significant hybridization as reported in other, uh, especially in the south of the United States, there are a lot of hybridization between trachemis. We evaluated if there was any more contemporary gene flow uh, signal, and no, we don't, we didn't find. Uh, this, this kind of analysis shows how um, there's very low or null effective migration between, again, the, 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 the pairs of elegans Acatospila, the neighboring one, or elegans and Venusta. No, uh, the, the, the result is strong barriers to gene flow. All, another really interesting result in, in, in our research, uh, especially our field work, was how we were expecting to find the invasive species, individuals of the invasive species, along our sampling field work. And we didn't find one single individual in the nature, native environment. Uh, you can see this is one of our sampling sites, very natural, very beautiful. And this is one of our sampling sites for the invasive, which is a park in the middle of a city in Veracruz State in Jalapa. And all our samples from uh, Trachemis scripta along, uh, along our sampling gradient are, come from artificial ponds, artificial water, freshwater things. No individuals in the wild. And Interesting too is that the genetics shows that all the samples that we have from native, again the native um, range, are genetically different, significantly genetically different from the individuals that we collected from the non-native uh, distribution, meaning our parks and ponds. And so they are different genetically. They are structured genetically different. So with all this back uh, all this information we had been gathering were, there was one obvious thing they're not um trachemis is not being invasive in our gradient at least not we don't know on the other side of the country but not in our in our field uh, study region and so we wanted to go a little bit deeper and what are the ecological factors the environmental factors that might be helping uh, this not uh, inter integration, this not hybridization, and keeping this, the distribution of the native species separated. Of course, there, there probably is competition there, but we weren't able to measure that. But what we did, you can see they are very, very different morphologically. You can tell them apart with no problem in the field. Um, many, many characteristics that uh, differentiate them. So we've decided to explore how, uh, in terms of their, their ecological niche, how different it was between the, 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 the three species in the, in the gradient. And a we went a little bit deeper into just uh, Trachemis scripta fundamental niche to, to explore more things. I'm not going to tell much about that. But what we found regarding the ecological niches there's the analysis, um, I'm not expert in, in this part, but we had a, a great team working on doing um, uh, um, methods specifically for this analysis, which involved niche evolution, niche hypervolume overlap measurements based on niche centroids, covariances, and Monte Carlo things. And what, uh, comparing using also simulations, and these are the results. If you compare the, the ecological niche hyper, hyper volume 
of the different species, there is little overlap, meaning for, this is elegance in the native distributions and the overlap with Catasphila following the, the gradient is about 40 something percent and it's much, much less when you compare with the uh, Venusta, which goes, follows in the, in the gradient. So the niches, the ecological niches are also telling us that there are apart, they're being differentiated. A similar comparison, but using species, the, the, the ecological information, the environmental information of species around the world where Trachemis scripta has invaded, established, and displaced the native species. Uh, we, we compare with different ones. I'm showing you here from US, Europe, Asia, and Australia. And you can see the hypervolumes all, or, all or overlap almost 100% or in, in very, very high percentage. Meaning that that's at least ecologically and environmentally, the niches are allowing, um, despite other biological uh, features that we are not measuring, allowing the invasive, the exotic species to occupy the niche and this place. Uh, so to wrap up on this, uh, the turtle study, we, we can say that elegance and its congeneric species that we evaluated in, in this gradient are differentiated genetically, environmentally, and uh, in, in their distribution. That native and non-native elegance is genetically differentiated also in, in, in where it could have invaded and is, is not invading. There is little admixture and hybridization in contrast to most of other invaded regions that have been studied. And that the, in, the invasion is, is certainly being limited by these other congeneric species in, with different means that we didn't evaluate entirely, but uh, that the genetics are at least showing us that. And that uh, I mentioned the, that we did a whole um, thing, an analysis with elegance, in particular this uh, recopilating information from the literature, a lot of information on um, temperature limits for different activities and different processes in the turtle. And the, the main conclusion of that part of the study is that there is a wide range of suitable um, places and suitable environmental conditions that are not yet occupied worldwide. And that is very bad news because mean, it means that Trachemis can still be invading or has the capability to invade, at least environmentally, other, other areas in the world that it hasn't reached yet. Okay. And uh, ah, now I will go into the crocodiles, hybridization and natives study, um, and you will see how they, they compile to two of the two areas that I started working with. Again, uh, many, many years have gone by doing this, this work and um, some of the publications that we have uh, been able to do. And I don't know how much you know about crocodiles in America, <laughs> but uh, there are 20, so f last census is 24 species of crocodiles, 23 of which are in some IUC uh, protection category, endangered, uh, threatened with extinction, etc. And okay, in Mexico, we have two, uh, two species that distribute there. The, American crocodile, Crocodilus acutus, that you can see goes all, all the way of the Pacific, um, Central America, and the northern of South America. Uh, the Caribbean islands, a uh, bit of Florida, is very widespread with an ample distribution. And we also have Crocodilus moreletti. Uh, in Spanish, we call it the, El Cocodrilo de Pantano. And Moreletti's crocodile, which uh, we like to say it's quasi endemic Mexican because it goes, uh, it distribution, it's from mid Tamaulipas uh, in the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula and it reaches Belize and Guatemala. Um, they, are, they are morphologically different. 
you can tell them apart. Uh, basically, there's diagnostic characteristics which uh, refer to the back scales, which are um, different distribution, different counts, and different arrangements. So acutus and moretti, you, you can, by that diagnostic character, you can, you can tell them apart. But also, um, acutus, Ameri the American crocodile is much slimmer, the face is longer, and um, it doesn't reach as big a size as, Mo as Moreletti. Moreletti is uh, it's like if you had hit him in the, in the face, so it's like more, yeah, and, and more rounded, and it's much, much robust uh, in, in individual. Um, in this, you know, uh, crocodiles are long, long divers, many, many millions of years ago, and we already knew for, from, the, from previous studies that these two species have a contact zone in, in, in the northern of the Yucatan Peninsula where they have been hybridizing for, for a while. <clears throat> and, uh, okay, having that background, what we wanted to know is how was, again, the, the, distribu the genetic distribution and the genetic information of these two species, because previous studies, studies have been very local, m m m many concentrated in this area, working with the hybrids, but nothing that uh, contemplated the entire distribution. And Gualberto, the, 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 the student that did this work, he had been working with crocodiles for, for many, many years, and he had, was able to sample, and his, his uh, goal in life was, I want to know every single crocodile in the entire country. And these are uh, the, the samples we work with for his cities. He has many, many more. And all these dots are sites where we have diff more, uh, many individuals. It's not one individual, it's populations with many individuals. And you can see the, uh, yeah, the, we have Moreletti from the Gulf of Mexico, Acutus from all the Pacific. For a total of 92 localities, over 370 <laughs> individuals, again, mitochondrial DNA sequences, um, microsatellites, and mo more recently, genomic data. And um, we, of course, concentrated our part of our sampling in the hybridization, already known hybridization zone. And, but the, the first results, the mitochondrial sequences and the microsatellite loci, I'll, I'll reveal that actually the hybridization, the hybrid individuals weren't concentrated here as it was supposed to be, but all along the Gulf of Mexico. And actually that the hybridization zone, zone was much more extended or most, yeah. And that on the contrary, we had very few populations where you, we had deep Moreletti's crocodile populations of the Moreletis crocodile not hybridizing. And we also found um, these two sites that are inland, they're um, inland water, freshwater zones that we had hybrids. And if you remember, Moreletti is in this side of the country, not in this side. Um, I forgot to say that another characteristic that differentiates these two species is the American crocodile has uh, salt glands, very well developed salt glands, which allow them to go into the ocean. That's why it's the, it's the species that you, you will find on, on the beaches. <laughs> uh, while uh, the Moreletis crocodile has the glands but are very, very tiny, not, not developed, and it cannot go into salt water or it will not last very long. It is more restricted to fresh water and that's why it's called the Pantano, the Pantano crocodile. So, well, these, these two sites were kind of surprising and kind of not because in these sites, um, well, in, let me show, these are the, 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 the sites that I, I highlighted. One is in the National Park, Cañón del Sumidero, where uh, well, the American crocodile is, is naturally distributed. And these other two are places where people are having or have been having uh, crocodile farms. 
where they reproduce the, the crocodiles for all the crocodile things they do, eat the meat, use the skin, you know. And, um, and so we, we, this is uh, the thesis of an undergrad student, and we had samples from these three sites. And that's what we found. Cañón del Sumidero, where American crocodile is, is native distribution, it's, it's acutus, it's, it's genetically differentiated from uh, the, the other two sites, eh, El Aguacate up here and Villaflores down here, which have a signal of American crocodile. We, we added samples from, um, from the, the, the Gulf of Mexico to make sure that we had the correct signal of uh, Moreletti in, this, in these areas. And in Villaflores, we even found not only hybrids, but F1s, F2s, and back crosses, meaning it's been a place where they are hybridizing for, for a long time, and corroborating that people have intentionally been moving huge animals, well, small, I guess they were small ones, uh, juveniles, from the, from the Gulf of Mexico, Maruletis, to these, to these farms, because they will get bigger uh, animals. And so uh, that had a very um, legislation influence, because well, though they shouldn't be doing that, and we're still fighting to stop uh, those uh, uh, artificial moving of, of individuals. And going into our um, genomic data, all, all analysis together, what we corroborated from what we had found in the microsatellites data is that we, yes, we have two clearly non-admixed um, parental populations, one American and one Moreletti, but we have this uh, region of hybrids, the more historical hybrids, which are in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, but we found two things that we weren't actually expecting. One, that we have another clade, another um, genetic group that differentiates two lineages of hybrids. One, the historical one, and one that you will see it's much more recent. And an and, uh, American, American crocodile lineage that differentiates very, very well, significantly from the American crocodile in the rest of the Pacific. And these are populations in two Caribbean islands, in, in, in Mexican Caribbean islands, that I'll show you the, the, um, where they are exactly. You can see here again another, we did a whole battery of analysis to, to, to finally come to these this conclusions and these five lineages or these five plates. We indeed uh, we're able to, to soundly say that, that the, the, the diversification into these five lineages is, is true. And there we have significant species boundaries. Here again, the two, Pacific, the two American crocodile lineages, one in the Pacific and one in the Caribbean islands. Um, the, Yucat, the historical hybrids, which have, you can see here, they have a, a lot of uh, signal of integration from more historical means, and our, our golf hybrids, a more recent one, uh, which had the golf hybrids had much have more admixture from the Moreletti uh, <coughs> species uh, and, and less from the Pacific. Another analysis showing that again it's an ancient um, that there, there has been um, a historical migration where an ancient Acutus lineage uh, uh, gave, uh, gave individuals or provided individuals, mi migra migrant individuals to the two hybrids and that ended differentiating in these two uh, American lineages. And to put it into the geographic context, uh, these are the, non, the parental non admixed Moreletti, again, very few in the uh, populations where you, we can actually say we don't have hybrid individuals. A lot of 
uh, Kutus populations, which still have their native distribution. And here is the Caribbean islands, which are two oceanic islands, not, they have not been connected to the continent, and where the American crocodile lineage is, is a new one, a different one. Mm, and uh, our historical Yucatan Peninsula hybrids and all this gradient of hybrids in, in the Gulf of Mexico. We explore a little bit of ecological niches here too. Um, we, we incorporate two, two response variables that are key for, for crocodiles, which is this distance to the rivers and distance to mangroves. Um, and very, very briefly here, just to show you that uh, the, the non-admixed Acutus and Moreletti have very distinctive niches, which differentiate from the both of the hybrids, which are more concentrated in the conditions that provided by this area of the Gulf of Mexico and this area of the Yucatan Peninsula, which have different, uh, different mangrove species, different soil, different many things. And um, what is next? Uh, we've gone all that far and we are still working with both, both species, but just to let you know a little bit of the um, crocodile data, we are now trying to explore potential adaptive, uh, local adaptation. And with very, very preliminary analysis and results, we, we've seen that there is diversifying selection that is involving different genes, different outlier loci for the both non mixed parentals compared to the Gulf of hybrids, uh, that's where we, we have enough data to analyze, that some loci are, um, outlier loci are related to environmental variables, mainly temperature, and that also uh, trying to map some of these candidate loci uh, we've uh, notated so far very, very few number of genes, but one pops out this gene that is related to bone formation and to bone bone proteins. And this might be import, important because as you remember, the scales, which is bone, is bone formed, are a characteristic that distinguishes the non unmixed parental species, but also it's an intermix in the hybrids. So uh, we're gonna go a little bit further there. And of course, we are trying to see, uh, to find genes involved in salt me metabolization, because that's another characteristic that we know that differentiates parentals. And hybrids, many of them are found in contact with salt water. So they're having this uh, part of Moreletti uh, from uh, the American crocodile that is able to go into the ocean, but some of them are at least don't move much from the mangroves area. So that's another uh, part we want, we really want to uh, explore. And conservation implications, there are zillions, and uh, that could be another, another talk. But I wanted to highlight two things, invasives. Uh, what do we do with that? Some of them we can control, some of them we try to eradicate or are able to eradicate, and some we're going to have to adopt them. And uh, some invasives, not the case of the, 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 the red slider turtle, that we really have to get rid of it. I don't know how, but we should. But yeah, so we have this conservation questions. Regarding hybrids, that's a whole world. There, there is, well, we have natural hybridizations like the crocodiles, but we also have many examples of anthropic uh, movement of individuals or release of exotics uh, where they don't go. And we don't have conservation guidelines uh, dealing with hybrids uh, individuals, not local, not international. And for example, the red list, the IUCN, mentions one, one point in the whole um, red list um, literature about apomictic plant hybrids. And that was in, but that's it, nothing else. So we don't, in, I didn't say, but uh, well, uh, the two crocodiles, the American and the um, 
Morelitis are in CITES 1 and CITES 2. And uh, people are always trying to get the, into the CITES 1, which is the one you can, you can um, use the products, use the animals uh, for products. And so people in Mexico that have these farms and, and have um, income from, from the crocodiles, they don't want Moreletti to be moved. And we come here and say, hey, a lot of your Moreletis are hybrids, not Moreletti. So what should we do with that? It's been, it's been crazy and we've been dealing with the local people working with crocodiles with IUCN and CITES for many years and we haven't won the war at all. And CITES, for example, uh, the only mention they do about hybrids is only those with recent lineage and meaning previous four generation of at least one of the two species parental. If it is included in one of the appendices, one or two, then it is considered a hybrid that should be in CITES. Uh, our hybrids don't they are ancient hybridization, so they are out of that. We can't go into that um, part of the legal action. And uh, yeah, uh, well, with that, I will finish and take any questions. Carlos and Jennifer are taking a sun bath. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, for the people in YouTube, uh, we are reading you, so you can ask as well in YouTube. Any questions in the room? Thank you for a very interesting talk. So for trachemis, I'm just wondering the lack of uh, introgression that you're finding in Mexico is that connected then with human behavior, do you think? Because is it because people just don't take their pet turtles all over the place and release them all over the place? Because that's really what happens in Europe, I think. That's in, why in term, yes, in terms of if they hybridize <coughs> sorry, with, with, with uh, Trachemis scripta, yes. But not with the other, among the other Catasphila and Venusta and this uh, with uh, Tylori because we didn't find any significant uh, hybridization among them. But yes, you, you're right. Uh, we don't know if we actually take the slider, the red slider to the, the field, if they wouldn't. Uh, yes, and that's hard to test. <laughs> we will have to do it in the uh, yeah, in garden experiments, not in the, in the, in the field, yes. Yeah, yeah. But I was wondering if you can give any, if you have any idea what are the, well, you say that the niche is different between the different species. What are the aspects that are different? Why, because the trachemis seems here to be found everywhere. And mm -hmm. you said that, uh, well, maybe the, is what Andy was saying, that they are just not released in those places, or is there anything that makes the niche different from the one used by the endemic species, or is it just that they were not released there? Uh, is, do you know yeah. anything that ma makes them different there? No, the, the, the niche, we have much more detail with the niche of, of, of the red slider, which is not, the, the one that is not released, uh, that has, very very f the limited uh, temperatures for basking for egg production for there is uh, even they have even measured uh, their their extreme limits above and uh, for warm and cold temperatures where after um, if they move over those temperatures they die and uh, but we don't have that that detail uh, information in terms of temperature and the, but the fact that the, the niches don't overlap, uh, and no, they don't overlap. Um, yeah, the, the data is saying that they don't overlap, even though we don't have the, the slider in, in the in the in, in the field. It's oh, well, the the answer is no. I don't have specific um, uh, data of variables that are 
differentiated the niche. And that's why I, I mentioned it has, it should have to deal with competition in different ways that you are not interested in. But there, yeah, the, the, what I can say is the, where, um, where Catespila is distributed, which is uh, the, the very core of the Gulf. The, the water is colder, uh, much colder. <laughs> Um, vegetation is, is, is more tropical, more, uh, there are more um, mangroves, whereas where Venusta is, is, is distributed, water is much warmer. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, that's much as I can say, yeah. But no, no, we don't have that fine data. Really quick, are those native um, subspecies or species, are they endangered or are they abundant? How, how is there, like, are there lots the, of them? The turtles? Yeah. The, the Catespila is endangered. Uh -huh. uh, very uh -huh. few, very, very, very few left in, 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 in the field. Venusta is not. Venusta is not in any category. It's, it's widespread. And we have also these, um, the subspecies things that um, we don't, uh, Venusta has two, at least two subspecies that might be telling you something different, but no, no, uh, but Catespila is, is endangered and Tylori is microendemic and, my, and super endangered. The, the good thing is we didn't find individuals in, in we were told that they were uh, it's, uh, red turtles in, 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 in the Tylori wetland systems. We didn't find them, but there is dif difficult field work in these are wetlands that extend for hectares and they, they get flooded in, 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 you know, in the rainy season and dry and turtles go beneath the, the soil, uh, wet soil and stay there. So we cannot assure there's not individuals in that part we didn't find them in we worked there three years but that is very endangered so they're endangered because of their distribution Be uh, Tylori because of restricted distribution and because of habitat modification and water uh, fresh water water bodies uh, drying just like in in Doñana we have uh, the same problem in in that area um, Thank you, very nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering if people there in Mexico uh, have also the turtles as pets, other trachemis, because here in Spain, before uh -huh. the trachemis wave, we had lots of terrapins as pets. Oh, really? We, we ate mm. them, and then we had them as pets. And when I was little, the animal shops were full of emis and ah. mauremis, so... Mm. No, no, no. Well, uh, I, I, no. Uh, it's only the red. I think, I guess, because of this red, attractive red color. Or, I, but no, uh, they they only sold the red turtle. And I said sold because it has forbidden since the 1990s. So it, you don't find them in pet stores anymore. You find them in the dark underground. But there's much not. not no, I don't know anyone having any red turtle now as, as pets. And people locally, for example, in, in Veracruz, where, where uh, Catespila is distributed, they, they take, take it from the wild and, and have it at home. But it's, at least it's the same species in the, that is distributed there, but not sold. And not eaten. We eat turtles, but not not that not not the, not the sliders. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just wanted to to know whether in the states, if there is any study in which they check the strict uh, artificial in like in artificial places and in, in their native areas to really know whether also in the states maybe there is uh, like okay, a okay okay. Mm. I don't know whether you uh, find no, also I, these... I, I, I know the, uh, b b the museums that, that allowed us to have tissue, they, they do continuously field work and they're still in, in, in the wild. And, but uh, funny that you mentioned it, I was walking once in New York City uh, in, I don't know, 
any big, big avenue. And uh, if there was a jewelry store, and I just turned around and there was this huge tank full of red sliders as uh, showing the rings and the ears. Yeah. So they, they, at least I saw one without looking for it uh, in captivity with huge red sliders. Okay, yeah, just to know whether maybe in the States there has been more admixture between the... Uh, there's has, there has been on the, on the southern mm -hmm. United States. Okay. Not, not trachemis crypta elegans, but other trachemis. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very well studied, the, the hybridization between two species of trachemis there. Mm -hmm. okay, any more questions? Since all, I was thinking about uh, when you say like, how, what do we do with an invasive species? To say uh, adoption between quotation marks. Uh -huh. <laughs> you mean like that's the question? You mean adoption like uh, like surrender or adoption like <laughs> like we cannot deal with the consequences with economical consequences of the this species? Like invasive species, they are invasive because maybe humans use them to gain economic credit and they are there for like 100 years or less but you cannot take that out of people now they are locked in okay i i wasn't thinking of the last uh point that you make but uh yeah of course uh, uh, the social and the economical variables have to be taken into account for sure i was re referring more for example uh, we haven't given we have given up on some uh, grass species in, in the African grass species that are across the country. And how do you get rid of grasses? So it's, let's just adopt them. And we have one uh, tree species uh, that, is, that is Asiatic. I can't remember, it's not Japanese, but it, it looks a little bit like the, the um, blue, blue What's the Japanese, this very colorful flowers? Blooms, uh, but anyways, it, it's, it's a, the, the, the tree in Mexico is called jacaranda, and it's, it has become one uh, emblematic uh, species. It's in one of the um, flags of one of the states. It's ours now. It's, 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 a, it's, a nat it's a national flower and it's an exotic in, invasive species, <laughs> but it is Mexican now. So uh, that's what I was referring to. But what you mentioned is important. Of course, the social and the economical part has to be taken into the equation, of course. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, nobody's asking about crocodiles. <laughs> so what's going on in Yucatan? I mean, you, you're talking about a different uh, a hybrid lineage, but in the analysis, does not, know like, uh, does not show like an admixture. You say that it's a hybrid with a, a water, a marine species, a cutus, but in the islands that are not very far away, it's a cutus that is also a different lineage, and they are not that far apart, and they remain differentiated, but two islands, mm, mm, yeah, if you can put them up, yeah, you can see the Caribbean islands, two islands that are quite far apart, uh -huh. the same Different. lineage, but supposedly the Yucatan Peninsula, they are offspring and they are hybrids with those ones that appear very differentiated. What the heck is going on? <laughs> okay, uh, well, the, the, the Caribbean islands m might seem very close, but they're not not many, many, many kilometers apart, but that's why I, I, I highlighted that they are oceanic islands, uh, never, never uh, in touch with the, the mainland. And there is a extreme, extremely uh, strong current uh, uh, that goes, runs uh, along, all along this, this region. And we have in, this is, this is Cozumel Island and this is Chinchorro. And we have a lot of endemics in these two islands because of high isolation. Uh, this, despite the fact that they, they seem, we have yeah, rodents. That, that's where the carnivores that Jennifer has been asking me about, the, the, the pygmy raccoon and the pygmy uh, el mapache y el cuati. Uh, they are endemic there and they're, you know, they have all these uh, island 
um, features, they're smaller, blah, blah. So it's not as surprising that these, these populations have, the, I, I'm, I think it, they have been evol um, diversifying and evol evolving into a, a different species. At least, at least now it's a different lineage of American crocodile. We also have the problem with the American crocodile that is Crocodilus acutus throughout the entire distribution. And there are publications that are highlighting that there are different things in different parts. Um, but uh, so th that's how I, I think they're being so isolated and, and differentiating. This is so historical. It's the, the oldest, um, and we, we dated it in somehow, it's the oldest coming in, 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 in contact of these two species. Uh, that's why it is still a differentiated hybrid lineage. And this gradient, it's, it's been more contemporary, but still long, long. And w w w what you find is that these ones have much more Moreletti admixture, and these have much more Acutus admixture. And that's what I think, among other things, are ten, uh, keeping them apart. Not that they not can interbreed, of course they, they, they can do, and they can and do interbreed. But uh, that's why I can, and, and these populations are geographically isolated unless you move them. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why these are much more, uh, have kept their, their genetics apart. Is there a blue one under that red? A blue where? Left, 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 left. Oh, yeah, yeah, another. You're hiding on one there. <laughs> no, and we have one here and one here. Two farms. Two farms, yeah. And, yeah, dealing with farmers, crocodile farmers, is a dangerous thing. <laughs> Not only because of the crocodiles. Mm. Okay, so thanks again, Ella, for this very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. If somebody wants to ask her any other of things, yes. she's going to be in the EVD until September. Yes. Thanks. Close by. No, 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 no. I stand. I stand. <laughs>